the fourth gospel, that of St. John, is called the theological gospel. In other words, St. John, the beloved apostle, takes the basic happenings of in Christ's life, the miracles, and he adds a few, like the wedding in Cana that we had not read before in other gospels, and explains the meaning of these miracles. He explains the meaning of things that he said. For instance, you must be born again. He explains more about the baptism in the Holy Spirit from St. John the Forerunner. So St. John's Gospel was given to those who had already been baptized and by the grace of the Holy Spirit were able to understand more deeply through this same Spirit the meaning of the salvation we have in Christ. The basic salvation is, of course, as explained even further uh, in the churches, in the letters of St. Paul to the churches he founded of the Gentiles, that the life of, of Christ, his saving message, is first of all to reconcile us with God, to then overcome death by his death, because the fear of death is what held man captive and made him uh, sin. In the correct translation of Romans 5.12, we have the antecedent death correctly given in the Orthodox translations. That is, that through Adam, death came to all of mankind, not sin. Sin is not the antecedent in that verse. So Christ came to release us from the hold that the enemy had over us because of fear of death. Thirdly, the Holy Spirit comes through Christ to deify us, to transform us, to transform us. This is the reason the Lord took those apostles, the chosen three, up to the Mount of Transfiguration, and he was transfigured before them in his human nature. It is those energies uh, of the deified human nature that allow us to partake of the incorruption of the very life of God. This is called the tree of immortality in the book of Genesis. We are allowed now to come into paradise through Christ and feed from the tree of the cross. He is the fruit of immortality. So we have this threefold uh, meaning of the life of Christ, the last of which is the transfiguration of the human person. It is this transfiguration that upsets the enemy of our soul so much. So much so that when we teach the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which allows the Holy Spirit to come in and begin this wonderful work of transformation, we have so many obstacles, arguments, uh, even to the point where a thousand years ago when this was taught as the baptism of tears by our Orthodox Fathers, uh, the abbot who was teaching this, St. Simeon, was attacked by his angry uh, monastics that he was over. They didn't want to hear about this Holy Spirit because, you see, it is the love of God which comes with the Holy Spirit. And this love requires everything from me. And they wanted to just have uh, their religion, their faith, their orthodoxy, and, and be satisfied with the ritual and with saying the words. Uh, this is fobbed off in our own day by the Western churches as what uh, worship is all about. Our whole lives, to the contrary, are to be given to God 
we are to ask Jesus Christ for the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And this is where, as it were, the rubber meets the road. This is where my will coincides with the Apostle's first experience of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. Thus, the original historical Pentecost becomes personalized in my life, empowering me and giving me tongues, giving me insight into Holy Scriptures, discernment of spirits. Whatever it is the Holy Spirit wants to give to each one in our congregation, thereby fitting out the body of Christ to war against the wolves which will invariably attack us as a church and as individuals. The task of the First Council of Nicaea after the persecutions had ended and Constantine uh, was crowned king as the first Christian king one of the major tasks was to define what the scriptural books were in the New Testament. What were the books that were the true Gospels written by the apostles themselves? They could verify the authorship of those books. Therefore, they could be passed along to generations after, guiding us with the words, gentle commands of Christ, so that we could obey these scriptures. The Holy Scriptures were also predicated upon the living tradition of the church. That's where they came out of. We have to stop and think. People that are insistent on sola scriptura do not realize that the church itself predated any of these written documents. It was the church who lived the book of Acts. They didn't sit and read about the book of Acts. We relive in orthodoxy the Acts of the Apostles, knowing that the same Spirit of the Lord Jesus Christ is alive in this church today. We must rediscover our first love in the Lord Jesus Christ who died for us, who lived for us, who rose from the dead, who fulfilled all of the Jewish feast days so that we don't have to go back and become Jewish again, like we see in many of the Protestant traditions. The Orthodox faith is the living out of the initial Jewish context. The prophets, the law which was fulfilled by Christ dying on the cross, nailing all of our sin, which was the offense of the law, to his tree of the cross. The law has been taken care of for those of us who come to Christ for forgiveness of sin. All of these feast days are seen for what they were intended to mean in the New Testament church as she lived them out long before the scriptures, the gospels, or the epistles were written. We must point you to the same New Testament Church, which is called Orthodox from the time of the First Council, even until today. Orthodox meaning right believing or right worship. There are two false views of scriptures present in the Western denominations. The Protestant uh, denominations which flowed out of the Roman Catholic Church, the first denomination, uh, is that Scripture is not properly used. Uh, the Roman Catholic Church denigrates Scripture and the Protestants idealize Scripture. We must understand what the Holy Scriptures are and what they are meant to be to us as Christians today.